all of California burns at some point. So you yeah. can't escape it. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, what, what we did escape was uh, any active memory of what happened. <laughs> Right, 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 right. No, I do, I do remember like years ago reading an article saying that California would be the probably the better place to be during climate change. And I'm gonna like do that. Right. Just, I need to find that article. And it turns out no places. <laughs> There's no places. Erewhon. 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 Nowhere. There's nowhere backwards. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of places backwards. Just look at Texas. Well, oh, California Texas is went unbelievable. Uh, yeah, but Texas is but 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 Texas the people in power. Not unsurprisingly. Well, what's surprising is the way the Supreme Court just looked the other way and said, mm -hmm. "Do what, do whatever you want. Go ahead." Install the Stasi. Turn your citizens in for attempting to have an abortion. We'll reward you. It's crazy. It's it, every is. every citizen has standing to sue anybody involved in an abortion. It's Except unbelievable. The woman. Except the woman. Right. They can't sue the woman, but they can sue her husband if he gives her a ride or someone who tells her where to go. It's like, uh, this is, as I saw last night on Facebook, someone said, Texas, where the handmaiden's tail meets the Taliban. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a cheerful start to our call today. Yeah. I, thought I'd, hey, I, thought I'd pick a, I thought I'd pick an appropriate background for the mood. So, hey. yes, very nice. Yeah, we were touching on where to go next. <laughs> well, we ain't going to Texas, that's for sure. So, not not to Texas. Not to Texas. Let no, them I'm, let them I drive. I live in Texas, so I don't have a choice on that. Yeah, that's right. Oh, we're we're move, in back you Texas. Could move from you Texas. Uh, I am in. Well, I say Dallas. Um, I'm in a, uh, a suburb near Lake uh, mm. called uh, the, the suburbs called the Colony, and the lake is Lake Lewis. So. It's not. It's not like you need a green card. Uh, huh? It's not like you need a green card to move. Uh, no. So I was born and bred in Dallas. So. <laughs> um, have you seen? Have you watched? Uh, uh, Jason Roberts' uh, TEDx talk about starting our uh, better block. It's not, it rings a bell. Uh, let me post it uh, to the chat. Uh, he is, it's just a lovely, lovely talk. He's, he's so excited to tell the story that he's like jumping up and down. Um, and then he tells the story of being in uh, uh, Oak Creek uh, neighborhood of South Dallas and uh, deciding to blackmail himself by posting a flyer that says, hey, show up at this intersection on this date and time and see what's up. And uh, he then convinces some buddies to go turn that intersection into a cafe, basically an outdoor cafe, pretend <clears throat> that it's a nice intersection. They paint a bike lane in, uh, a local nursery donates some potted trees. So they put those in to make sort of a bike lane and, and some fringe. They, put, they set up some outdoor tables with, with uh, umbrellas. Uh, they serve coffee. Uh, and then they hang a big banner on the, on the brick wall of the empty warehouse that says Oak Creek Arts District. Uh, and then just to make their point, um, they print and then paste on that wall all the ordinances, the city ordinances that they're violating by doing this. Just in case somebody were to come by and say, gosh, this was a great idea. Why don't we do this? Uh, and, and in the process, they launch a movement called Better Block that starts to spring up in lots of places. I have no idea if they're still alive or whatever, but I just I just love his his talk. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ken. Hi, so everybody. I'll, I'll, post a, uh, I'll post the link to it in the uh, Mattermost chat. Hey, Jerry, it occurs to me, I was looking for the link this morning. I didn't see you put an email out about the call. I have been lax on that. I should probably do that now, huh? Yeah, I'm just saying, well, here's the thing. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe we'll have a small attendance and we can have a, different conversation or maybe you want to prop a whole bunch of people join us so you think about that i'm not sure that my kicking it out on the list brings that many more uh, otmers into the call so there's i'm willing to bet that most people don't have the link bookmarked and if they don't see it in their email it's like oh well and because we don't today. have a shared calendar uh, i am going to uh send a note to the otm list real quick thanks um so talk amongst yourselves for a moment Hey, Dave. 
Dave, are you, you, that's not your usual place or are you somewhere else? It's a rec- It's a different background. We're in uh, Vermont. Yeah. Vermont. Where in Vermont? Uh, Lake Willoughby. It's on the Northeast Kingdom. So we're, we're, I don't know, 30 miles from Canada. Cool. cool. I love Vermont. I'm good. Right. It's beautiful. Um, um, while I'm doing that. Um, yeah, the, the Vermont is nice. I heard. I heard it's a safe place to be. I heard it has like green mountains. <laughs> and there's some boys in those mountains right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you? Have you been affected by the weather? Everything's missed us. It turns. It turns east before it gets to us. So, like, we're watching all the floods in New York City and stuff on the videos. But yeah. um, it's it's sunny here. So. New York City was insane last night. I don't know if we caught any of the YouTube videos, but there was flash flooding in New York. And, in uh, some ways. Yeah. And on the streets, there was a, a picture, it was a, a video of um, a bus going through this lake, essentially, and women standing on the, ch- on the seats because the entire uh, aisle of the bus was flooded right up to the level of the seats. Wow. I know, this is insane. And here we are, you know, in need of, dire need of water out here on the West Coast. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, can you just ship the water around in different places? I'm having, I'm having every time a uh, very interesting conversations about the uh, things. And I'm just wondering, am I, am I, I, I might sound like a jerk or an asshole every time. That, you know, that the, the last one was about, uh, what, what, what is it you posted about the oral history of the world? Like, uh, the working people, I think it was. It's not an oral history of the world. It's an oral history of it, of the people who came to be known as the Iroquois. Yeah. I'm going to sound like an asshole every time. You did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, to say that Paula's not an Iroquois without knowing her story is, is you know, um, it wasn't the best move. What is your, what is your beef on Paula? That she's not. I, I, and you know this for a fact? Well, um, there is there is a that's why I wanted to 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 bring that up. There are a couple of uh, really interesting um, resources to to check on people's claim. Well, um, and Native American is like blood quantum sort of weird weird stuff to be a well, that's enrolled well, member in the U.S. It's all, it all gets very strange. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm I'm not I'm not the best person to talk about it, but. One of the things that seems to be coming back in many conversations about that is um, that a, a tribe claims you or claims the person rather than the person claiming an heritage. Um, it's it's really it's of course very difficult to to um, to address in in that. But there are a couple of resources. One is by uh, Jacqueline uh, Killer. Uh, who is a journalist, um, um, Native American journalist and author. And the other one is an old website that I've known for quite a very long time, and it's called uh, newagefraud.org. I can post that somewhere. And so you can type any person that claims to be Native American and you're not sure and see what these what, what this, um, uh, Native American researchers have done to see if that person's claim hold. Yeah, our website is New Age Frauds and Plastic Shamans. No, that one is New Age Fraud Singular.org. That's where I am. And at the top of the page, it's NAFPS, New Age Frauds and Plastic Shamans. I'm just reading from the website. Oh, and Plastic Shamans, yes. Yeah. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And so there is something about, about that. And, and, and who is behind this website? Uh, some, some Native American. <laughs> uh, one it, is says, called, it says who we are. Uh, I'm so who we are doesn't list any names, which is very suspicious to me. No, well, we should not be very suspicious to you. Okay. Uh, it, it, just needs, any... it just needs it just needs a little bit of research. It's all forum. Uh-huh. Um, the people that were there for it, 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 the old the old issue about uh, what's called pretendience 
right? And 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 how they acquire so much fame is such a sensitive topic that I you know I don't feel very comfortable getting into. Uh, so for there's what what is called lateral violence, and for a lot of Native Americans that do this research, um, they would rather you know feel completely uh, um, shielded from the public, rather than than it, you know speak a lot. And perfect example is Jacqueline Killer who's made the, uh, a list of about 200 pretendians. And what she aims to uh, demonstrating is that all these people are in place, especially in universities, academic and art, um, and would do everything in their power to keep, to keep hold of you know, the power that acquired over the age, even though they have absolutely no claims, no, you know, they, they're basically stealing uh, an identity. Um, and, and she has received a lot of backlash. And, um, and yet she has continued doing it. She has listed about 200 individuals, uh, prominent artists or scholars, uh, academics, and, um, and exposed them. Um, so so it's really called the Pollen, the Pollen Nation, I think it's called. Um, The pollination.com uh, newsletter. Uh, no, that's you know, not that one. seems seems I'll like it's not it. I'll post it. Maybe it's org. Pollination magazine. Um, yeah, the pollination magazine. Thank you. Uh, so it's just pollination magazine. Nova that in front of it. Uh, commentary by leading indigenous thinkers and writers, critiques and analysis, etc. Uh, so. And this, the, their tagline is dedicated to fighting the invisibility of native people. Yes, and um, here, she has put that in the chat if ever anyone's interested. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, adding and, it to the Mattermost chat since we, we seem to be oh, losing, okay. we seem right. to be losing a message discipline chat on right. Mattermost right. so that it's persistent. So let's try to do that. All right. Um, anyone else? Do you want to turn over this rock about about um, authentic origins? Who gets to speak for whom? I had actually not heard the term lateral violence. I just looked it up. I was like, oh shit, right? Um, lateral violence uh, appears to be when you attack who those people who should be your peers on your side instead of the other side, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, and, it, and it and again, it is it is super difficult because of all you know the the, the history of uh, Native Americans and how um, states and governments have done everything in their power to destroy the social fabric of these people, and so be, between the 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 kids that have been kidnapped or taken away from their families to other tribes or people that felt important for them to leave and move away and uh, not necessarily on the role or um, officially recognized or having a tribal citizen card and so forth, uh, it becomes very problematic, especially for adoptees. So there is a lot there, you know, just there. But, but what Jacqueline Killer has done is really focused on the people that are actually making money. And, and her next step is to um, quantify that. How much is actually taken by way of people applying for grants, for instance, claiming to be Native American, right. and taking that away from <laughs> people who should uh, who should be there? But to go back to uh, Paula Underwood, um, she's one of many that have claimed some sort of a uh, you know connections with, with uh, a tribe or a nation and, and speak on their behalf. And when the, the, I'm, always, I'm always very uncomfortable because from what I have experienced personally, that it, it does not happen. It's very rare. And usually some one white person who will come and say, well, you know, I, I was given that task. Um, it's, a, it's already a, almost like, right away a red flag. Um, 
Um, anyone else with feelings about about um, this issue about about outing people who are pretending to be something they shouldn't be in general, specifically about uh, native tribes in the U.S. Uh, any of that kind of thing? Because it's it's, um, it's it's touchy. It's important. It's sad to me that some that peoples who have been through so much also have this to go through in different ways. It's like, damn. Um, Ken, do you want to jump in? Well, I, I can speak not in general, but I can speak about Paula because I knew Paula and. Um, I first met Paula at a Systems Thinking and Action Conference where I was, um, uh, I was a volunteer and I was assigned to her room. And um, I was amazed because I, I saw this woman who did not look native at all. And, you know, she's got this medicine wheel up on the board and she's giving these teachings. And it's like, this is the right place for me. This woman is, is bringing some really great wisdom to business people. And uh, I, I wanted to talk to her and, um, she was really busy. There's a lot going on. So the next morning, I saw her in the coffee shop and approached her and asked if I could speak with her a little bit. And I found out her story that her grandfather's great great grandmother was Iroquois, and um, there was a council going on where they decided that they were going to abandon the old ways and adopt the European ways to in order to avoid the genocide. And she realized what that meant for her. So she was a wisdom keeper, and she went back to her um, lodgings and grabbed everything that she could and fled the village. And the man who stayed behind defended her exit at the cost of his life. And she went into town, which you know was a little tiny settlement, and said, I am no longer, a, she went to a Quaker household and said, I am no longer of the people, will you shelter me? So when they came looking for her, she, the Quakers who will not lie said, there are none of your people here. And so she passed down her knowledge through a Quaker line of European descendants. So, uh, and Paula never hid that. She never attempted to say that she was pure Iroquois. She told her story quite openly. Um, and uh, when I met her, you know, I told her my personal story of when I played cowboys and Indians as a kid, I was more interested in being the Indian than the cowboy. And that I had this, there's, there's no native blood anywhere in my ancestry, at least according to 23andMe until we go back to Neanderthal times, right? And and she said, well, you know, there are two heritages. You have your, your biological heritage and your spiritual heritage. And um, you're clearly, you know, you have a spiritual heritage that's connected to Turtle Island. And then I, I think of Maladoma Same, who I also did some work with. And he said, you know, he, he had met more indigenous people in Europe and North America than he ever met in Africa. And his theory is that when you kill the indigenous people, their souls re-inhabit the children uh, and grandchildren of, of the uh, genociders. Of the murderers? Of the murderers, exactly. Wow. Wow. And I just, I love that, that thought. So um, I got great benefit from Paula's teachings. And I know Paula was, was um, ostracized by many people who were Native American. Um, some embraced her and some said, no, you don't have the right to do this. But she felt that the teachings that she had, the wisdom that she was able to impart was worth putting out there despite the heat um, and I, I don't see her as a fraud at all based on what I learned from her, which was extremely valuable. So I know it's controversial, um, you know, and I don't step into that controversy. I just, I met someone who was a really deep and wonderful teacher who was extremely generous with her teachings. Didn't, um, you know, I don't think she was making, she was, she was hardly rich. I, I, I she lived out in Fairfax and she was not, uh, you know, she was fairly marginalized her whole life because she was a woman attempting to bring indigenous wisdom to the world and um, not exactly embraced as, hey, you know, there's a televangelist, let's send money to her, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I'll leave the whole controversy of whether she was or was not Iroquois. I mean, uh, grandfather's great, great grandmother. Okay, that's back a lot of generations. But to me, it's not so much the blood purity as what are you carrying forward and what are you able to impart to people that's useful? So that's where I, uh, I come down. And I will say that when she wrote The Walking People, she actually journeyed. She used, you know, she drummed and, and, and journeyed in order to um, live into the stories that she was told that were passed down to her. Um, and I think it's a, I've read this book. It's an extremely interesting book. It's about this thick. It's kind of a poem. And reading it puts you into an altered state. You can really feel um, that, that this is a very well-crafted tale. And I know somebody who 
it's another native person who said this is only about 30 percent of what anybody of what any um, tribe would know so she's got one third of a tribe's wisdom it's not comprehensive but it's far more comprehensive than than what most uh, modern people have in terms of understanding you know history and how to be in the world and this topic also slips right into cultural appropriation mm -hmm. and and into hey uh, so one of my beliefs is that we used to understand how to be together in community on the commons awesome and we used to know that in indigenous tribes around the world who uh, Europeans have systematically tried to wipe out. And I guess everybody else tried to, but Europeans like systematically went around the world trying to stamp out the people, the culture, the language, the native dress, the everything. Um, and so how are we to reintegrate that knowledge? How are we to work with it in productive ways unless some of the people who are not indigenous try really hard to bring it back, to revive it, to fit it with what's going on, to promote the change, to do whatever, whatever it might be. And then, how do we do that work without misappropriating uh, what it all is? Hank, great to see you. You're in the red. <laughs> yes, I am. Only virtually, though. Excellent. Um, but anyone have uh, anyone have thoughts about cultural appropriation and the right the right way to walk through walk this path? Well, it's interesting who we individually actually identify with. Uh, I find myself uh, at times identifying with all the DNA in the woods around me. Uh, so I'm part of that. Uh, sometimes I think I'm connected to the cave painters and the Neanderthals. Uh, and I, my guess is that we all have these kinds of mixed identities now that, that span all over the place. And if you if you go into the spiritual realm and talk, either either talk about reincarnation and afterlives or just talk about the, the general mixing of our souls and and uh, how that works, that gets really really fuzzy really fast, and it also gets really lovely really, really quickly because uh, you can begin to see origins, alliances, connections, meanings, uh, other sorts of things that 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 are unrelated to your physical presence. Um, which is interesting. And then, you know, uh, and then just a separate note, uh, all of uh, sort of the Africans and Eastern Europeans and others that are sort of coming back to Europe and trying and, and like Europe is anti-immigrant and so forth. I'm like, dude, this is called just desserts. Like you are the colonists. They speak your language only because your ancestors showed up and wiped out theirs and made them be like your people. So now they like work. Um, it's like, uh, Please, and then and then and then I look at the European um, football teams, and and they are incredibly mixed and beautiful. Like you, and, and then people in the stands pissed at how mixed they are, right? People, racists in the stands who are throwing things at them and yelling at them. It's like we we just can't seem to get past this. So, um, so I collect stories of white nationalists who who sort of switched all, all that kind of stuff. I have a you know, there's a whole. Uh, I'll, I'll share a link to my brain to sort of. Uh, white nationalists who, who woke up and, and came to the other side and then become activists to try to deprogram some of their um, colleagues and family and friends and all that kind of thing. But this is this is just this this boiling, seething um, issue under the global uh, veneer of thin veneer of civilization that that would be lovely to find a way <laughs> to, to lance this thing. Um. I, I don't know if this is true. I saw it on Facebook, so it's a meme. So, I'm gonna take so it has it. to be true. <laughs> it must be true, exactly. So uh, it said there is one holiday that is celebrated more than anything else on earth. And it is celebrated by 135 nations. And it is, guess what? Independence Day from Britain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the most well, popular so holiday on the planet. So it so must good. be true because it aligns with my values. <laughs> But, you know, you think about that, of, of um, just, just that whole history of colonization, empire and colonization, and it goes on today here inside this little cranium, you know, of how colonized is your mind. And I just want to put a little plug in. Um, this is my latest book that I'm reading called, oh, it's blurred, sorry, Negotiating the Non-Negotiable, sorry. Put it right book. in front of your face. Yeah, uh, right in front of my face. How's that? Yes, there we go. Now it's in focus. Negotiating the Non-Negotiable by, by Daniel Shapiro, who is the um, 
uh, founder and director of the Harvard International Negotiation Program. Oh, cool. and, um, it's excellent. I'm only 20 pages in, so but I'm drawn in immediately because he starts off with a story of being at Davos and working with 50 world leaders, you know, behind the scenes, out of the sight of the cameras. And, and they're, they're told, okay, you have to, you're sitting at tables of six, you have to form tribes and um, you must solve these problems. You have one hour and you have to answer things like, should capital punishment be legal? And this professor says, you know, uh, this is impossible. We can't do this an hour. And he says, no, no, everybody who does this does it an hour. And of course they don't. And so suddenly the room goes dark and there's this loud bang and a flash and this alien comes in and says, I am here to destroy the earth. You have one hour to come up with, um, with values and, and form a tribe that I can negotiate with to prevent from, from destroying the earth. And of course they can't do it and the earth gets destroyed. And he's like, this book is what I have learned about how to bring people together so they, so they actually can save the earth rather than, than uh, destroy it because we divide into all these these things and and there's a professor there that says you did this you made this hard you told us we had to do these things and he says you're right i did i gave you these rules but you played by the rules you didn't say this is ridiculous we should change the rules so you made the choice and i was like whoa so this is how the book starts and i'm like yeah i want to read this book he's he's a very good writer and and tells great stories and and offers a lot of of you know, this is what I've learned to really difficult situations where people have been in genocides and, and horrible things and of how to get past your, your values. So he talks about relational identity and core identity. And it's just, I can't recommend it highly enough. So, so the lesson I'm taking from your, your lovely short story right now is we should all play Calvin ball. Absolutely. We need to Does play Calvin ball. Know what, Mark, do you know what Calvin ball is? Is he so Calvin Sorry. and Hobbes. Yes. Know the, okay. Yes. So Cal, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes played this game called Calvin Ball, where they made the rules up as they went along. So if Hobbes didn't like what Calvin, he said that you're violating this rule, and I'm going to make this rule, and Calvin would do the same thing. And so it's like Calvin Ball is is it's it's delightful anarchy. <laughs> it's it's a fun game. It's yeah. an infinite game, one could say. It it's it's always game. it's always the other, but not me. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's um, just like the uh, what is it? What is it called? The the do do what I say, not what I do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's um, empire. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, sorry, I was going back one step here. I, I don't, I don't want to. Game rules are also interesting. The NF, the NFL does that a lot too. So they play Calvin Ball when they need to. But uh, I, I was thinking back on the um, we visited Monticello you know, with the kids probably, I don't know, 20 years ago and got a tour of the, you know, the beautiful house and what Jefferson had done to it and things like that. And then went again, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when they had introduced the slave tour and um, they actually had, you know, they would take you out to like the, you know, the place where the slave huts had been. And, and the old white guy would give a little bit of explanation about what was going, what had happened. But, but he was an old white guy, you know, and he was kind of uncomfortable with those kind of things. And there would be questions then about like what did Jefferson do with the slaves and what happened and and he and how Jefferson didn't didn't free um, I don't know the, the history exactly but didn't free um, Hem, Hem, Hemings um, and like you know or or the kids and he says but you know but some of the some of the slaves did walk off the plantation and you know and then I'm and he's he the term walk off the plantation a few times and I didn't know what it meant and and it was basically you know they were white enough to pass. And so they could leave the plantation, wow. move into white, be, move in, be white, and then get the hell out of Virginia, basically. You had to get, I don't know, past, past Ohio or something like that. And then you became white. And it was better to be able to walk off the plantation than it was to be a freed slave, right? Because you'd, you'd change race. And it's so interesting in the context of, I mean, one is like the woman who like, who, who like was, was outed for really being white when she was acting black, kind of. And I was thinking, oh, mm -hmm. you could actually... <clears throat> Go either way, I suppose, right? You can pass either direction um, and change race, but you know, and then the idea that race is a fiction, um, and you know, you adopt it in your culture, kind of. But anyway, I, I found that that story, and I don't. I'm really curious to go back to uh, Monticello now and see how they're how they're doing the slave tours. But uh, and the, the the sort of the use of the euphemism, and it may be an unintentional euphemism, but they were able to walk away, which has no meaning to the average visitor. They don't know. That that's the full con the, the larger context of what it means. Like, oh, oh they, they walked away. How weren't there slave patrols? What like what what what's like what's going on here? So thank you for that. 
Appreciate that. Have you seen and High on the Hog? I've started seeing it. I've not uh, finished the series, but we've been it's, watching. It's an excellent show on Netflix about the history of, of how African American tra cuisine transferred in America. And um, one of the, there was an extremely gifted chef who served both Washington and Jefferson. And, um, you know, he'd be cooking for, for the, the, the elite of the land, right? Um, and he was in, when they would travel to Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania had a law that any slave who stayed in Pennsylvania for six months would become free. So at five and a half months, both Washington and Jefferson would ship this slave back to their plantation for six months. This is, these are the people that we hold up as the icons of the, found, the founding fathers, right? It's like they had um, some really nasty aspects to them, um, you know. So we need to and the, be uh, mindful of this. One other, one other tidbit on that one, Ken, like the, at the very last episode, they, they go to the Church of the Immaculate Barbecue in Huntsville, Texas. I've eaten there and it's quite tasty. Um, also, a, a good series to watch before you watch uh, High on the Hog is The Black Church, which is a three-hour, I think, PBS series, which was a real eye-opener for me. It's like, oh, okay. And, and I'm, I'm a, sorry, I'm a church skeptic, et cetera, et cetera. But the role the church has played for the black, black community is astonishing. And the AME, I'm like, whoa, okay. Uh, I suddenly start to understand other, other, other pieces of what's going on a little bit. And so is Franchise, The Golden Arches in America, which is a book that I have not read. It's in my queue, but I saw the presentation by the author. Um, McDonald's has played an enormous role in the empowerment of black people. There's, um, I mean, it's, it was really fascinating book talk. Um, one, I didn't realize McDonald's is not a restaurant. It's a, it's a real estate, real estate company. company. Yeah. And um, the reason they're able to stay in business is, is all the real estate they own. And very often what happened is the, um, uh, the black people who were able to buy franchises at McDonald's would become the de facto mayors of quote, black town. Um, they'd be the ones who brokered deals and, and they're kind of like godfathers in a way. Um, so it, it opened up huge economic opportunities for, for black people and um, also um, gave them enormous power inside their communities. So if you have a chance to check that out, I'll, I recommend it. I heard the woman who wrote it is, is extremely um, uh, good researcher and, and really did her homework on this. I went to hear her speak right before the pandemic. So last, one of the last things I saw was she gave a book talk at the Jewish Community Center here in San Francisco. Love that, thank you. Monsieur Thibault. Yeah, I don't know which one I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about first. Yeah, I mean, church, you know, there is church and church. There is church, the church of the people and church, the church of those guy upstairs. <laughs> Right, so the 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 thing that goes right now in Haiti, for instance, is a lot of on the on the on the place that has uh, been hit by the earthquake, um, the last one. Um, they they, I think they calculated that about or they recorded that about anywhere between two hundred and three hundred churches had been hit by the earthquake. It's not a big area where you know, most of the damage was, but two to 300 mm -hmm. churches, that's a lot. Um, and, and, but to, to go back to um, the, the issue of, of, of pretending and, and taking another people's identity, I think a lot of what some people like, uh, uh, what, was, what was this guy, Carlos Castaneda? That's another one who um, fictionized the story and maybe, you know, um, and, and, Great books too, great books too. But at the end, you just feel like cheated. So what is the need of claiming to be someone when you can actually be that someone? I don't know, without pretending to be Native American or to have met this wizard somewhere in uh, Mexico or Yucatan or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit sad you know, to, to, to say the least. But um, uh, my dear friend Ken, I'm sorry, but if you want, you can check the, all the research that they've done on Pola on newh.org and, um, and you'll see that her great, 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 whatever. Uh, uh -huh. is actually the daughter of an Indian fighter. That's make it even sadder. But I'm, 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 let's move on. <laughs> something fun, nicer and funnier. 
Um, and again, anybody who's got good resources on cultural appropriation and how to avoid it, uh, please share, because that's, I think, really important here. Well, Jack um, King Killer actually has a podcast, um, and you can find it on Facebook, the Pollen Nation, or the uh, Pollen Nation magazine on Facebook, and um, she, she has covered a lot of ground, so, and how to avoid it, and, you know, the proper ways uh, to repair it, etc. and she's pretty good. Thank you. Um, so let's go into our check-in check -in rhythm uh, a bit here. And uh, let's go, uh, Hank, Craig, Dave. All right. Well, I'm back. <laughs> um, it's been a long time. Great to see many familiar faces and a few new ones. Um, just for a sense about how long it's been, Ken, I did not know that you shaved. So there we go. Um, <laughs> but good to see everybody. Um, it's interesting that you guys were started you know, that I kind of came in as you were talking about um, cultural appropriation and all that stuff. I think recently I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I've been like really trying to read a ton this year and I've been successful at it. Uh, and the last book I literally just finished, it was Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. It was the first, um, I know it's like on everybody's list, right? Um and I've really engaged in a lot of conversations about it or tried to at least. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, I haven't really grappled with that specific conversation, but it's one that's in my head, right. Of like, how do you revisit all these, um, cultures that were in, well, specifically America, right. In the, in the case that I was looking at or, and, you know, the Americas, I would say without kind of taking that position of, you know, universality of like, Oh, um, you know, the subtle racism that can be associated with, you know, oh, it is my job as a, you know, white individual or as an American to to step down and put you in this place of, of power because, you know, I took it from you. And um, it's, it's a kind of a weird line um, to, to toe and one that I think that that I've been grappling with personally um, in, in some conversations. Right. And um, so that, that's kind of where where my head has been at. Um, I mean, you know, and otherwise, um, it's been nice. I'm gonna take a real kind of hard pivot from that. Um, you know, I haven't been in these calls for for a long time, um, and I was missing them a lot. But uh, that gap created an opportunity, I think, for me to start bringing some of these conversations into the work that we've been doing with clients. And I know Matt talked about it a little bit last week, so don't want to. Um, you know, beat that, beat that into a, beat that down here. But um, it, it's been cool. Um, and it's been, I think, uh, uh, reinforcing in a way that like, even though this group can be small sometimes, um, that a lot of people are, are thinking about a lot of this stuff um, and just doing things differently. So um, I really kind of valued keeping up with the recordings and at least participating in the conversation asynchronously. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, that's my check-in. Thanks, Hank. Um, much appreciated. Uh, let's go Craig, Dave, Michael. I'll only take a short moment. Hello, everybody. I, I've just had a busy, busy week, nothing particularly OGME. But the, uh, the uh, discussion about colonization reminded me of uh, something I heard. This is lighthearted. The invaders come to your country. They kill your sons, rape your daughters, steal your resources. They might build a road or a railway, but when they leave, everything turns to shit. And that's why it's called colonization. Oh. <laughs> there's, there's a colon involved. <laughs> there's a colon involved, yeah. That was a comedian in Singapore. Chinese Singaporean. That's me. <laughs> that's your that's your full on check in. <laughs> well, thank you. I haven't heard that one. Um, let's go, Dave Michael Stacey. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's changed very much since last week. I'm still focusing on um, kind of how to make the global regeneration collab useful. Uh, the 
trying to develop this idea of what it means to do peer-to-peer -peer support for regeneration makers um, and trying to figure out if we're actually on a path of success or not. What the, you know, like if you're trying to get on an exponential curve, how do you know you're on one versus just like flat, you know, things like that. And then maybe uh, some theories that like, we've been holding lots and lots and lots of Zoom meetings. And, and I think recently the characters changed a little bit. So people are kind of asking for support around projects they want to do or ways they want to make income and things like that. And I, I'm, you know, there's a theory that is that all of the Zoom meetings that we've done so far have created enough kind of trust and awareness that people are now able to kind of ask for more support and other people are willing to give it. So it's like a hopeful kind of uh, intuition, but I'm not exactly sure if it's true or not. Um, but, um, you know, it's like kind of this open question around what, what, what is useful to do to help people be more successful at the work that they want to do. And then a, a leap of faith that the work that they want to do is actually going to contribute to a, you know, a better world out in the future. So um, that's the, the puzzle of the moment. And I'm still trying to figure out how to, to capture that in Google ads too. So, you know, there's the technical. Nice. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, Michael, Stacy, Ken. And Michael, if you're off planet right now, uh, we'll come back to you. No, I was just trying to uh, get to my microphone. Can you guys hear me okay? We hear you just fine. Are you, are you okay. performing the spacewalk right now? I am actually in a car. Um, oh, good. Um, but, uh, it's very similar. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, interesting from a check-in point of view, I am uh, headed up to rendezvous with Vincent Arena and uh, Wendy McLean, who I don't know if, whether she's been in uh, OGM meetings before, but also overlaps a number of our communities. But we're uh, getting some face-to-face -face time for the first time. Um, so it's always interesting when, uh, when the, the OGM community bleeds into to meet space. Um, Absolutely. Please say hi for us. I, I will do that. Um, and, and Wendy McLean's been on our chats. I'm not sure she's been in any of the Thursday calls, but she's around. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave her the um, the Zoom link for today's call. I can't really scroll through to see who all is on the call, but she um, she may be with us in the future. Cool. Um, it's uh, it's the wake of the flood here, um, and uh, it's there's sadly. You know the uh, the remnants of of Hurricane Ida um, hit New York last night, and it really was kind of unprecedented in terms of the amount of water on the the streets of Brooklyn. It was sort of an ankle deep rushing river. Um, there were some fatalities here. Um, you know, people who drowned in their apartments or drowned in their cars. So it's oh. nature. Nature doing what nature does and um uh but it's a it's a bright and sunny day today um with still some road closures and um yeah that's that's my check-in thanks michael and and have a great like face-to-face -face meetings i remember those um fondly stacy ken bentley yeah well i was late today also because coming home from upstate there was so much flooding, it took me an hour to get a half a mile. And then I just had to like go around the world to get home. So that was kind of shocking, like going past, you know, the shopping center and it literally was a pond. So that, that, and then I have to say coming into this conversation was really hard. It was very, very heavy for me. Um, but to just bring it back to like where we are in our own lives, I've been watching this show um, Gentification on Netflix um, and it's the Mexican experience and they happen to be working in a restaurant and there's like a Chef Ramsay type guy. And I'm thinking, I, I'm guessing you all know who Chef Ramsay is, Hell's Kitchen, you know? And I'm just thinking, we sit and we watch this behavior and then we rush to get to the restaurant. And why are we supporting people that treat other people like that, regardless of what demographic they're treating like that? 
just, you know, um, <laughs> again, I always think in terms of TV and I just have these like fantasies of interviewing Chef Ramsay about his horrible behavior. Um, and last night I was with friends of mine upstate um, in Garrison, beautiful home. It was beautiful to watch the rain from a full, you know, windows all over. But when, when the husband came home, he was talking to me about a client he had. And this man was like a real Trump supporter. And I like looked at him like, so what was the conversation? And he really, you know, the guy was like attacking Biden for looking at his watch. And he really put the business relationship to the side a little. And, you know, he tread lightly. But I, I really thanked him. I said, you know, because I know, I know how much it's asking somebody to speak up when their livelihood is at stake. So I really do appreciate when people do that. But as a culture, if we did it together without like attacking, without like swinging the pendulum, you're all bad, you're all good. It could be so much more effective. Like I don't think Chef Ramsey, Ramsey's a bad guy. I mean, I don't know if he's a bad guy, but it's not okay to talk to people like that. I lived in a relationship where I got spoken to like that. It's not okay. And I just, I think that's something we have to deal with collectively. And that's my check-in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Stacey, thank you. Um, and I think being gentle in how we go about is a good thing. Um, dealing with these gently and, and and our, our conversation was kind of heavy at the start when you stepped in, Stacy. partly because Mark launched us into a topic that I picked up on because I thought it was like interesting and important. And he, um, and he had replied pretty sharply to a, a comment of Ken's on a Facebook forum. Um, and that kind of got us sort of moving into this topic. So in, in that way, and, and I think like uh, handling one another more gently would be a good thing. Um, and, and inquire within and sort of opening up the spirit of collective inquiry where it's appropriate and where we can to try to figure out what, you know, what are these kinds of issues and unpacking them. Um, but thank you. Uh, and I didn't know about Gentified at all. Had never Gentified. heard of the series. I, well, in, in, in Spanish, it's Gente. Oh. It's people. It's, <laughs> gente means people. And so, and so Gentified is a pun on gentrified, right? Uh, right. But I, I hadn't heard of this series at all, like like totally a mystery to me. And I'm like, damn, looks great. I love it. I just started. I, I really love it. More to watch. More <laughs> more of our life hours to absorb on other people on on flat panels. It's like perfect. Um, sorry, um, Julian. Thanks for joining. Me. Uh, so and Craig, good to see you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, let's go, um, Ken, yeah, exactly, uh, Ken, Mark, and Julian. So Stacey, I'd put a link in there uh, in the chat for some good chef behavior. I don't know how many people know um, Chef Jose Andreas, uh, but he is um, the, the chef I most admire in the world today. This man um, is an amazing humanitarian, and right now he's in Haiti. Um, he goes into disaster areas and works with existing restaurant crews and restaurants and local uh, producers to not just crank out meals ready to eat like the like the FEMA does, but actual gourmet meals that really nourish people. And um, he's on the ground every time. And I read an article, a profile about him in the New York Times a while ago, where he is an incredible organizer. Uh, he's not just a chef and, and he really, you know, uh, there, there are people who are in awe of him in the emergency preparedness and emergency response community of the way this guy is able to bring people together. So um, there are antidotes to the Ramses out there. And so just throw that out. Um, Hank, it's really great to see you. Um, yeah, I shaved a few months ago. Um, I've actually been doing some work for Collective Next on um, these inclusion dialogues. And I, I've got to say, I've done 25 of them now. And um, it is really... Uh, heartening to see the way that people are embracing what's going on. There were a lot of interviews where they pulled uh, scenarios from the culture of non-inclusive behavior, which are then enacted by voice actors. And um, 
the the folks that I've been facilitating, uh, the most common response has been, you know, I'm not surprised, but I'm sad these things are still going on. And um, they're really grappling with these. Uh, so, you know, this is a global financial services firm and um, it, it just, it brings a ray of hope to my life that um, if this is happening inside, uh, financial services is a pretty, you know, um, exclusive industry and the fact that these people are really grappling with this and um, making sincere efforts to be more inclusive um, it, it's it lights me up in the sense that maybe this can spread to some other sectors of the of the economy and really make uh, a difference I mean an antidote for all of the the hatred and all, all the the vitriol and pathology that I'm seeing on the on the white on the right wing that's going on um, so you know uh, I watched this panel conversation the other day and Kim Stanley Robinson was one of the, the speakers. And he said, if you think of humanity as kind of an estuary flow, um, you know, we're all, we're all coming down and headed for this larger ocean and- um, Renew, on, renew. Uh, and oh, on wrong the, movie, sorry. On the top is, is froth and chop and the media reports on the froth and chop, but that ignores the deeper tides and currents of people who are working really hard to make the world better. And I just, I love that image, um, you know, that, that I'm interested in the deeper currents and the tides. Um, and there are counter tides and counter currents, but they're, they're you know, uh, Martin Luther King, the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. And Gandhi's talk about no matter how uh, terrible a tyrant is, you know, sooner or later the tyrants are overthrown and deposed and they, they have their moments and then they disappear and then they pop back up again later. So I have to, to do this for my own heart, my own soul, um, to focus on that and find ways to, um, to find an appropriate focus of goodness in the world, or I go, I, I get into despair and I go crazy. So I'm just grateful that, um, thanks to, uh, Collective Next and, and Matt to be invited in and as part of this work, it's, it's been a, a really gratifying part of my life. That's, that's what's going on with me right now. So thank you. And Please, Hank, pass my uh, appreciation on to Matt. I know he's super busy, so. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, I really appreciate that. Uh, let's go Mark, Julian, Doug, then. And I leave at the top of the hour. Oh, okay. Uh, Mark, Julian, Doug, Vincent, and then me. Um, my, one of my, well, actually my very first real job um, was um, with a, a company that was pioneering um, research-based models um, to support people into making decisions. And that involved a lot of uh, data gathering. Um, so market research, um, but also running um, trials and testing. And and really that has, that has stayed with me. Um, I'm, kind of actually really enjoying doing research of that type just to, you know every every time and, and I see I see a lot of um, articles written about um, whether it's these uh, meta-analysis meta-studies and so forth um, and and for instance you know in in, in the food space um, the impact of eating red meat for instance on, on, on people's health. And I'm always wondering, but what was the question? Because the question defines the answer. And very often what, what, what we read are just an interpretation of something and not necessarily backed up by something that is of uh, um, um, high level of confidence. So a lot of these studies are actually low confidence results, outcomes. And, and um, um, so I, I'm, I'm enjoying that and, and finally found the time to, um, and I spoke to, to Jerry about it, to, to really look into the interaction between early humans and the megafauna. Um, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a roll to dispel the myth of uh, humans ending megafauna, annihilating uh, the era of the megafauna. And um, um, that should be complete pretty soon. So I'd be happy to share that with, uh, with all of you if you're interested.
That's my... I, am, I am interested totally. Okay. And, and 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 in fact, um, it would be interesting to represent it as a story or visually or as an argument or as a mind. I'm, I can sort of do it, you know, in my brain as a mind map. Uh, and there are, you know, there are other things like that, but I feel pretty strongly. So. For example, uh, many people are convinced that life used to be nasty, brutish, and short, uh, in particular short. Uh, and it turns out that infant mortality was pretty high. But if you made it to like 40, um, there were lots of old people. Like we find old bones. People grew to a nice ripe old age. Maybe they'd lose their teeth and have trouble digesting. But, but, but like lifespan itself, human lifespan has not increased dramatically. Sanitation has, has not enabled people to live longer and clean earthing processes and a whole bunch of life-saving techniques and a bunch of other things just change the, 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 the humps on the statistics. Um, but, it, but it's not that people, you know, 3,000 years ago lived to be 30. Uh, that, 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 that's weird. And so, and so how do you tell that story? What do you do? And I think each of us probably has a couple of things like that where we run contrary to a generalized accepted conventional wisdom and wouldn't it be great if only everybody knew this thing, right? Um, and then at some point we slide over into like, did you know that everybody's actually lizard people in control of the kind of, of the world? And then that that's the, like a bridge too far, I think, <clears throat> um, to mix metaphors. I don't know that the lizard people and the bridge too far necessarily cross culturally. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, just just interested in how we represent those things and how we tell again how we tell these stories, Bentley. Yeah, I just want to say one of the uh, potential ways to to share that in a useful way because a lot of those topics would be um, contentious um, is the Gullibot project. So when we talk about visualizing those, um, if people want to take their meaningful expression and if it's going to be a contentious issue, uh, can schedule some time and try and put it in about format and see if that helps people understand the nuances that, uh, and the reason why they, they may have to change their thinking on that. So I just want to mention that. Um, thank you. And do you have uh, a link? Uh, 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 you feel, we'll put a link in the chats, yeah. um, which is easy. And um, also, I'd love for you to explain what you mean a little bit more, but also there's a weird audio artifact when you're speaking. We're getting like a, a little digital rush after oh. every time you say something. So it's not coming through clean. Let me change. I think your flux capacitor is overheating or something. Uh, I'm using I'm using right. Sutori at the moment. Is that better? Yes, no artifact. Uh, your voice is now thinner because you don't have a nice mic, but we're not getting the little funny digital rush. It was like it was like yeah. at the end of everything you would say, there'd be that like like there was a wave breaking over your voice. Yeah, that was probably this one. Oh, now anyways, again. is it? Yes, it's still happening again. So it's not the microphone. It's something else in your Zoom connection or somewhere else upstream. Oh, don't um, worry about it. Uh, we'd love to hear it more. Out. We'd love to hear more about what you mean by putting it, by connecting these ideas with Golibot. How would that work? So Golibot, um, when you're kind of like expressing something like, um, uh, you know, humans did not, you know, meaningfully reduce the megafauna, um, that that it's great to express that in a story, but also to have some simple way for everyone to kind of look at the facts um, mm -hmm. and to, and the, uh, I say pros and cons, but the reasons for and against kind of believing that as a, as a main fact. Uh, Golibot is, is a hierarchy, uh, well, it's a character, but it's a hierarchy of those facts and the reasons and showing how they add up to the main score of what Golibot believes about it. And then if people disagree with what Gullibot believes, Gullibot, they can then talk to Gullibot, add those facts to it. And it's kind of a community project of, of doing fact-based reasoning to come to a conclusion on a, on a fact like that. Um, so that, that just sounds like one of the good examples. It's not, some of the things that the project doesn't work with is like, oh, what should we do about climate change? <laughs> But, mm -hmm. but if you're saying we should do this, then then Golibot could have the discussion or that something did happen in the past. That's a good example. Super interesting. Thanks, Kelly. Sure. Um, and let's go. Um, we have a Julian, Doug, Vincent, me. So Mark, with respect to your dialogue about questions and answers, just remember the answer is 42. 
Uh, and, a zero, uh, and a zero at the end for 20, <laughs> depending on, you know, how you feel in the morning. Uh, I've had a real up and down week. On Monday afternoon, I had a chat with my advisors about the computer graphics history project, and they agreed that it should be reformulated to cover not just ACM SIGGRAPH, but all computer graphics organizations. Uh, this is something that's always bothered me, is kind of leaving out a good chunk of history. So for the last couple of days, I've been up to my elbows in Unity reformulating all of this stuff, which is joyful to be getting work done again. Um, but with a down of dealing with a traumatized kitty who managed to get himself into a bad situation and earned himself a day at the vet. But uh, he seems to be comfortable now. So. Um, you can do video loops as your background in Zoom. So maybe at some point you record a little bit of your Unity worlds and make them your, your, your Zoom background. That'd be kind of cool. You can, huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I'll look into that. It's like some people will have like a beach scene where you can see the trees waving and whatnot, or, or whatnot. It's totally, do, totally doable. <clears throat> just for just for fun. Since yes. you've got since you've got that flash to the past of mist in the in the background right now. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's go, Doug, Vincent, and me. Okay, I'm finding myself uh, fairly inarticulate this morning. I guess the flow of everything going on. But I've got a quote from Richard Feynman, whom we all probably love in one way or another. And I had not seen this quote before and I find it amazing. He says, we are at the very beginning of time for the human race. It is not unreasonable that we grapple with problems, but there are tens of thousands of years in the future. Our responsibility is to do what we can, learn what we can, improve the situation and pass them on. I just find that remarkable. I mean, the idea that we're at the beginning of the human race, it's obvious and I've never heard it. It's lovely, yeah, yeah. Um, it, changes, it changes the whole perspective, doesn't it? It does. Well, and then like, race and evolution and all that are suddenly like at a manipulable elbow point or junction in history where we can now mess with DNA, we can now do, uh, what are they, what is it called? Uh, gene races, gene runs, gene drives, gene drives through populations of creatures. Uh, we've, we've clearly got Anthropocene effects changing the landscape and the flora and fauna and all that kind of thing so that the, uh, our evolution, the normal pace of this evolution, I think, is, is now being interrupted, um, which means to last 10,000 years, we've got to be right, pretty good at this. So, you know, to last several more tens of thousands of years. Anybody else on, on sort of how young humanity is or where we are? We certainly act like a youth, like an irresponsible youth. Well, it, it depends if we have to go back all the way to, you know, Three million years ago, with Homo habilis or uh, Homo erectus, um, but there is, there is, yeah, I mean, Homo sapiens sapiens, three hundred thousand years. And I think Homo habilis didn't have Zoom, right? They were not. They were yeah, not traveling in Zoom windows. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, they, I, they were interacting, you know, in a way that was much more manageable. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, thanks, Doug. And I'm also a big fan of, of Dick Feynman. He's like pretty damn brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, Vincent, and then are you around? Come in, Vincent. Come back in the airlock. Ah, he's going to sit for now. Okay. Um, sounds good. So let 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 me check in for a bit. Um, which is confusing because I've had so many conversations lately that I'm trying to sort all these things out and figure out how they all fit. Um, for OGM, the place that I've come to, which I'm trying to figure out how to explain well is, uh, and then I haven't started this yet. And I'm like, okay, should I, should I go ahead and start it? We do a lot of calls like this. We, uh, and this, if we packaged it up a little bit differently, it could easily be like a podcast or a blog or a show. So it's interesting. 
in, in what we do. Um, but the thing I, I think I'm, I'm heading toward is uh, something that on the surface looks like a show or a blog uh, called Weaving the World. And that what we do is with, with these devices that, that you know, the brain, Kumu, uh, graph is, all these different thing, things are kind of looms. They're kind of idea looms uh, and connectors of humans and, and thoughts and concepts and so forth. And so weaving the world on the surface would look like an interview show where we would go talk to people uh, who, were, who have really good ideas for trying to solve the problems that we've been sitting here talking about. But under the surface, we would be doing ogm -y kind of stuff, our ogm -y, uh, jujitsu on, on the calls, on the raw materials of the calls, on the information in the calls, uh, on all the things that are sort of going around them. And just, um, uh, so I, I haven't, uh, my machine is sort of, the fan is on and it's unhappy, but you know, as we've been talking through these different, these different things, I, every week I curate just live, uh, curate our Zoom calls, the, the whole list of Zoom calls are here. Uh, so, so every one of our calls looks like, sort of like this as they build. So here's, here's the list of, of all the OGM calls we've had. Uh, every little red icon is a fave icon to YouTube. So if you wanted to play the call, you would just go there. Uh, after I've uploaded today's call, uh, the present icon, uh, this, is, this is the thought that I created uh, during this call for this call. And then I've got it connected to the Jason Roberts TEDx talk, to Paula Underwood, to Calvin Ball, to Gentified. Gully bot, lateral violence, negotiating the non-negotiable, which I did have in my brain, but not well connected. And so what I do afterward is I go back to all the tabs and I, and I, and I curate this. This is just sort of an example of, of one aspect of the weaving that I'm talking about. And then uh, what are we weaving and why? Like, is this just like a tapestry to hang on the wall? And there's two metaphors that, that I'm kind of torn between. I, I sort of have favorites now, but uh, one metaphor is that we're weaving a big quilt of what we know with other people. And uh, the fun, there's a couple of fun aspects about a patchwork quilt. Uh, one is that each of the patches is sort of internally consistent and hopefully beautiful, like, like the patches themselves come together. And the second is that it's a social act to make a patchwork quilt. And many of these uh, are done in quilting bees where lots of people get together and work on the quilt. Um, and it's also often a feminine uh, art or craft uh, which is good because we have way too many sort of uh, martial and sports and other kinds of metaphoric things going on that are too masculine. Uh, however, the big quilt is this uh, fuzzy soft thing that is kind of inert and it's not an active uh, feeling thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm unclear about how powerful the metaphor is, although I like it for the reasons I just said. And my alternate metaphor is actually that we're busy and, and here it's immediate mixed metaphors because we're not really weaving but more curating or gardening the big fungus. So I bought the bigfungus.org and Stacy's liking the big fungus. I love the big fungus. And the big fungus, you have to sort of tell the story of, of leaf cutter ants who can't digest leaves. So why are they cutting leaves? They're feeding the fungus. They're basically farming uh, a symbiotic fungus that lives inside their hive and metabolizes the leaf matter and oozes the nectar and tasty parts that all the ants actually feed off of. And, and for me, sitting there mining away at this brain thing for 23 years, I felt like a, like a lonely ant at the fungus face, uh, busy putting things in, digesting, mulching, digesting, connecting, trying to explain like my own perspective on how the world works and who's trying to fix it and what the problems are, and how systemic race, institutional racism works and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and hence my questions earlier in this call about how do we tell these stories without misappropriating them? How do we fold them into modern narratives in a way that actually works? Who gets to tell these stories and who doesn't? And is that a fair question, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really deeply interested in, in those aspects of it because I'm trying to do this, this act. And, and as I sit there, sort of the lone ant at the fungus face, I'm really, really interested in doing this with everybody else, anybody who feels like it, anybody who wants to. And there are, there are other people out there. So Mark Carranza isn't on this call, but he's been feeding a personal fungus since 1984. He wrote, a, he wrote a piece of software he calls MX, which is inspired by Memex, uh, the Vannevar Bush's uh, idea of this, this sort of ongoing memo that you would consult. And he's been feeding this thing and it's written in DOS. He's never gotten out of DOS. So every day he's taking notes in a little DOS window on his computer into this, this MX thing. But, but he's got his notes woven together for since 1984. That's pretty good. Except his notes are not interoperable with my notes in the brain are not interoperable with Christina Bowen taking notes in Kumu, 
uh, are not interoperable with any of us drawing a diagram, and procreate and sharing it as a JPEG or a, or a PDF. These things are all just floating around in the ether. And we're fortunate if any of them has a, has a URL so, I, so, so we can point to them. So one of the things I can do in the brain is point to any resource that has a, a link in the world, which is cool. And then how do we visualize these things? Julian would love to help us visualize these things in three dimensions and walk through them and instantiate them as, as artifacts, objects, uh, maybe stories or, or, or terrains or something like that. I would love to have that happen, right? Um, so, so that's kind of where we're moving. And, I, and I'm, the thing I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to explain better is, uh, so OGM is not an organization necessarily. It's more of a movement or a hashtag it would like to have this show called Weaving the World that, that is the, 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 the above surface thing that looks normal that people can be attracted to. And what we want to do is attract people sort of below ground metaphorically to feed the fungus together and to figure out, okay, let's slow this conversation down. And I, I had a call yesterday evening with a woman who's in the Philippines, uh, super interesting, super smart, and she shared a diagram with me that was kind of her story of civilization, kind of. And it had sort of, it was organic, it was teardroppy, it was, it was appealing, attractive, and, and it communicated a lot to me. And we had a great conversation over it that I wanna sort of repeat as an episode of Weaving the, of the World, because, because slowing that down, mapping what I know and what I understand to it, letting it affect my narratives of how I think things happen is a piece of this process. And then, and then and motivating other people to create other shows to feed the same fungus. Right, so that weaving the world is just the, the first show in this sequence of doing this. Who else would like to come join us to to, to uh, help elaborate this shared resource over time, which isn't just a bunch of sort of files out in the world, but is in fact more useful than that. Uh, so that that's kind of the, the the place I'm at. It's hard because I'm every conversation I have makes this more interesting and more complicated and shifts my focus on it. You know, uh, Pete, Pete Kaminsky is the one who said a couple weeks ago about uh, is OGM an organization or is it more of a hashtag or a movement? And by the end of the call, I was like, well, damn, I think it's more of a movement or, or a hashtag. Then it, it solves a lot of problems that were in my head to have it not be an organization, for example. Uh, so, so how all these moving parts actually fit uh, is really interesting and important to me. And I'm trying to make that all kind of happen. So Stacy and Julian. Hey, Aaron. Right. You are muted still, Stacy. Are you are you having a hard time finding us to unmute? Yes. Okay, I got it. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to share with you uh, why I like the fungus because I was thinking about this last night. It's both natural and magical, which brings the feminine back in in a way that doesn't have the power, the negative power dynamics. And I also think it's appealing to a younger generation as opposed to weaving, you know. And it's, it's also like making poop jokes. It's like, what do you mean the big fungus, right? It's kind of, it's kind of memorable and funny. And then when, once you sort of get inside the story, you're like, I love this. Like ants do what? So, so thank you. And it just feels very androgynous. <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to say is, um, again, to go back to the idea that I've been bringing up of the game show. So when I heard Ken talking and he mentioned that wonderful chef, the first thing I thought of, wouldn't it be a great competition if that chef went to six different places and the challenge was on those six different peoples to replicate what he does? That's the kind of challenges I'm talking about. So it's weaving, but it's also feeding the fungus and watching it grow at the same time. Uh, and and by, by the metaphor of putting mulching leaves into the fungus and having it ooze nectar and tasty bits, the nectar and tasty bits, the, the nourishing parts for civilization are things like, hey, here's a story and here's maybe even sort of roughly instructions of what that chef does when he lands in a community. Um, so that they're easier for anybody else to try to replicate, improve, riff on, do whatever, so that, so that things that work are more easily at hand and then applicable everywhere. And, and nothing actually sticks at part of my amateur theory of, of change <clears throat> at a community level is that nothing actually sticks um, in organizations unless they appropriate it entirely uh, for themselves. They, 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 like, if you show up and say, we've done a study and we figured out the best practices for doing X, X, Y, and Z, and all you have to do is follow our instructions precisely, 
and all will be good, that almost never actually works. That, 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 that like breaks all the time. But when people sort of can appropriate them and make them their own, that works a lot because then they've made it theirs, they're invested, they, 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 you know, they figured out how it, how it adapts to their situation on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's this looseness about how to bring wisdom, uh, make wisdom available uh, in the world that's important, I think, that matters in, in how to do this. Um, Julian. I uh, just wanted to make sure I went to the bigfungus.org and it's just an abstract pattern. It doesn't do anything yet, right? Is that correct? Uh, yes, there's just a, a picture of woven basket and I, I'm busy writing text to put on it as a start. That is correct. It's a placeholder website. Uh, you're entirely correct. It, it, the, the fungus is just dry at this point. It's just like an empty cave nest that, that I need to plant some starter in. You mean it, it needs rain too? Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, well, let's, uh, Eric, do you want to check in? Yes. Uh, so I, I was just in the weaving lab. That's um, another similar group, remarkably similar group. They have weaving lab? Uh, yeah. Sweet. They're based, yeah, they're based in Amsterdam and they're about network weaving and systems change. How about that? How about that? <laughs> there was this guy talking about how he got burned out um, trying to create all the kinds of movements after the, uh, the, the Arab Spring. And he, he created a lot of social change efforts, but he said, yeah, because I burned out also, it had a lot of effect on the rest of the movement. So for me, that was a really nice insight on well-being and how important it is to be able to also realize stuff into the world. When I hear a huge group of people that actually are doing change in the world, agreeing to it and making it really important, like they, they even put it in, in the center of what they do is well-being, universal well-being, they call it. So it's something like universal income, they call it universal well-being, you could say. So very inspiring. Um, and after what I heard you say, I wanted to bring up in something else is uh, one model amongst the so many is that of the heart, the hands, and the brain. Um, I see Jerry as someone really strong on the brain <laughs> and also a really good heart. And then the doing, um, yeah, also quite a lot. You created quite a lot of things. And at the same time, there's something about pragmatism. And I'm like, hmm. Maybe I can be kind of the, the pragmatical counterweight in this group or something. <laughs> but I also would like everyone to, to invite everyone to think about how can we be pragmatic in OGM? What is the things that we want to realize? Because one will feed into the other and they are two dimensions. They are kind of parallel, but they're very different dyna in dynamics. It's a bit, I guess, in my setup, I, I had this idea, okay, there's a separate business model that generates the money and then this gen this feeds back into what I want to really do. And for OGM, um, I was talking about it with Michael yesterday. I think if I, if I want to prioritize what would ever get money, if we would get money uh, into OGM, it would be when it makes a difference. That's the first thing that I would like to give money to is where does it create social change? Because that's that's the best business case as well when we really as a group would create uh, some kind of social change that's really visible, it, it proves our theory of change, um, then that would be amazing. So I'm, I'm really thinking about what is exactly the business model. And it, I think it, it also, this, it's like a separate track. It's like a two track model. One is for the money and the pragmatics and building infrastructure. And the other is what, what is this really about? Yeah, of course, knowledge is kind of deeper quality, all the wisdom and insight, all the multitude of multitudes that can nourish so much. So I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, that's my two cents now. <laughs> um, thanks, Eric. And, and that, that uh, to me, is sort of a polarity to manage. Um, and there's this, 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 this thing called polarity management that says wherever you see kind of opposites, very often it's actually polarities to manage and go between. And in this case, it's like 
abstraction and concrete action, right? So, so, um, so if, if all we did was pragmatic stuff, we probably wouldn't see any big picture. We spend a ton of time in big picture and we don't do enough pragmatics. Um, so we need to balance that out. And part of what, part of what I'm trying to figure out is how to describe um, projects that are bite-sized pieces uh, that uh, then describe a mosaic. Um, and I'll, I'll, so, so I did five, do I still have them open? I don't think I have them open. Oh, I do, hot oh, damn. Let me do a screen share for a second. Um, and just show, uh, so imagine a multi-plane camera. So a multi-plane camera is how, you, how they used to shoot cartoons. So you put the characters up here, you put their immediate background here, you put the mountains and the, and the, the trees and the sun back here, and then you shoot and you move different parts of the scene to make motion and, and create animation. So forget the animation part, but, but think of this as one layer of a, of a multi-layer mosaic. Uh, and so uh, the, one of the layers is entity. So this is the view from OGM's mass. So this is OGM where we have weaving the world would be a show that's feeding the big fungus in the spirit of the generative commons. Here is the massive human intelligence project, which is Pete's project and massive wiki and the idea of context weavers. Massive wiki is infrastructure for the big fungus and so are other things. Uh, and then here is Vincent and Trove. Uh, here is Stacy's show game uh, and a bunch, you know, here's Marc-Antoine Parent and the, the, uh, the Hyper Knowledge Project. Uh, if I go to participants, uh, this lays over the, the bubbles I just showed you. So these, these are the humans that are involved in the projects that are in the layer below, but these humans are also involved in other projects. So they're, they're separated from the bubbles, they're not in the bubbles because kind of there's these interesting links that would, it would be nice to see uh, between them. Uh, then this is kind of um, how we do what we do, which is like several of us use different kinds of tools, whether it's the brain or factor. Uh, we, we have conversations in Zooms like this one right now on Google Groups and Mattermost and Discourse. Uh, we then put some of our information on GitHub to share using tools like Massive Wiki and that there is an OGM Wiki. And what we'd like to have is a project dashboard that we can fund projects to go fill pieces of, of the mosaic I'm showing you right now. And then, uh, what about entities, infrastructure, participants? Oh, uh, and then this is kind of the, the meat and potatoes layer of this diagram, which, uh, which is uh, up on the left here, this is sort of the flow, the, the information torrent, uh, which, is, uh, which is dotted with little nuggets of juicy stuff in the, in the flow. Uh, so these are all events happening over time. And some of these nuggets are videos, or transcripts of the videos or clean links from the videos like, like uh, Bentley and Pete have been extracting uh, just the links from Zoom chats, for example, that's a small project uh, to which we would add metadata and then we would store all this in a public place to create a shared memory. Then some of us, a few of us are turning these into narratives or into maps like I just showed you I'm doing with the brain. Uh, they, they might look like topic maps or argumentation or debate logic or animations. And then this squiggly line here is sort of what I'm calling the fungus face because we're putting these out in the public use somewhere. They're not very well linked right now. And then this square, this rectangle here is basically magic happens here. Um, how do we get into an arena, a space, a conversation space, a trusted space where we can compare these narratives and maps, enrich them, link them, weave them together into the actual shared asset that we can then use to go back and do policy and do education and do science with. And then there's a line here because awkwardly on the far right here, everything is squishy and human and soft. And it's really about, we, we're never going to get to this point of a shared memory or narratives or arguments or visualization if we don't actually sort of trust each other. And if we can't sit down and have a good conversation. So this is about deep listening, bridging the cultural divide, creating safe spaces, and then allowing many different people with individual points of view manifest in whatever this set of tools are that appeals to them to play in this conversation and, and for all of us together to ask better questions and then figure out what experiments will answer our questions, what, what people should be invited in who might be able to help us elaborate those, those questions. And with luck, we don't end up with a big dog's breakfast of like all, you know, too many points of view and too many things to catch up with. But some of these start to overlap and crystallize and we start getting some more integral points of view. Uh, by integral, I don't mean to call out Ken Wilbur and integral thinking. I just mean that these are sort of integrated uh, viewpoints in some way and that that could actually be really useful to policy arguments to other sorts of things. So this is, this is like a layer right dead in the middle 
of this mosaic that I think OGM might be. Um, mm. And I'll share these documents in the OGM chat uh, channel. Um, any thoughts, re reactions to that? Does that make sense? It, it, yes, although I need to process a bit for a while. And I also still miss a part of the pragmatic and of what is the fundraising model? What is the theory of change that we have that we can present to external organizations? Oh. That's yeah. a very simple story um, yeah. that people yeah. can really call. Yeah. Yes, and I just realized I, as, as I did oh. before, I, I forgot to show the projects layer. <clears throat> the Weaving Lab, by the way, is organized by Ashoka because I see the label there. <laughs> oh, interesting, fascinating, okay. Um, so, so I forgot to show the projects layer, which is the important piece. Think of these rectangles as mosaic individual tiles that could be funded. The idea of the projects layer is to have a dashboard or a big board overhead, like when you go to the airport and see what flights are going out. These, that these would be the, the projects that our communities, um, uh, GRC, OGM, uh, other, so other kind of communities that are loosely linked. These are projects that we would like to fund. So uh, Marc-Antoine might, this is just me conjecturing, right? Marc-Antoine might create a sub-project of his project where he can model a claim that's useful in the, 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 uh, the big fungus. Um, what if we had a graphic recording app that allowed you to create deep links in the drawing you were drawing so that those links wove out into the big fungus? That could be a small project. Um, Pete has a project idea out called Opal, which is a massive wiki from Dan. So what would it look like? Uh, you know, he needs some funding and some support to actually write some software to make massive wiki, a, more of a wissy wiki. Um, I, we have group, there's all sorts of different pattern languages out there in the world, Puragaji, uh, liberating structures, wise democracy pattern language that are like just pattern languages sitting on websites. How do we instrument them so that they actually like are completely useful and usable in a, an improving world? And then the game shifting iPad frame app, which may sound totally opaque, is a way to do that. Um, I'm borrowing game shifting here from Arthur Brock, who kind of created a group uh, facilitation process that's not, that, that feels to me like it would make a great iPad app. So that if we were sitting in a meeting and we had this app, we could then swap in different forms of facilitation. So we could say, hey, let's implement one, two, four, all from liberating structures right now. And one, two, four, all is a, is a pattern and a practical group process tool that says, when you have an, a deep question you want to address in a group, give everybody some, some time by themselves, pair them up, put them in fours, and then come back to plenary. And that process is really nice for getting more people to meet, getting richer ideas, et cetera, et cetera. That's one of, one of the patterns in the uh, liberating structures. So how would an interface help a facilitator of a conversation run that, right? And, and uh, a friend of ours does, there are now Zaplets or Zaps, I think they're called, I'm forgetting, Zoom apps. So Ross Mayfield has joined Zoom and he's busy trying to promote third parties to come up with Zoom apps. This could be a Zoom app, right? Um, and then we get sort of Zoom connected into uh, iPad, connected into whatever else. Anyway, um, uh, long riff, but uh, that's kind of where, where the thinking is going. So Eric, to your point, the dashboard of fundable projects, we need, to, we need to all try to create a discipline where we know how to describe a fundable project in a roughly sort of template kind of format where the projects are, are more or less comparable in terms of goals, yeah. resources, fit, et cetera. But also a main narrative that sells. Uh, I would say like a, a, a whole, like it shouldn't just sound, oh, this is nice. It also should sound essential and something that makes a concrete literal difference in people's lives, even if they never heard about these knowledge mapping things, so. So the layer that's missing is the why this matters layer, um, which I totally, I totally agree. Like, why are we doing this? I, I, I completely agree and I, I want to do that. Yeah, and, 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 and towards also to the target or audience that's not us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, interestingly, the why this matters layer of this multiplane sort of model, mosaic model, is also one of the maps that goes into the mystical rectangle of, of how things, you know, uh, of, of points of view of why things work. So, so that the model becomes a tiny bit kind of rec recursive or, you know, internal. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so totally, I, I need to, I need to draw that layer and, and, and 
I'll scan it. But that's kind of where things are headed. Any other so thoughts on there, that? I have a thought about the uh, sort of like why this matters or like questions about projects. Um, when I tend, when I was like applying for, you know, like startup funding, um, I had, I maintained a list of like all the questions that applications asked and then like kind of like a templated response that way when I when I applied for like you know application number 37 I was like oh okay I already have the answer to like five out of the six of these questions from like a past application I could just copy and paste that tweak it a little bit um, I'm wondering if we have any start of like a list of those questions that like um, like a superset of all the questions to ask about a project um trove probably has a lot of the like the ones that would not be free text um because we're focused on like you know filtering a project directory by like location or by topic or by type like the questions that are like where is this located or what locations is it serving like um i guess the the questions that i was thinking about is like you know what what impact project making in the world or what is the what is the vision of this project like the ones that are kind of more like free text response that could be worded in lots of different ways um and that you know that would probably once you find the project you know the questions that would really help you understand it and dive deeper in um so awesome uh, you raised a whole bunch of great things one is that we don't have but would love to have uh, sort of a list of good questions and answers and how those things work. Um, we're at this moment not trying to sort of go apply for grants in different places. It's complicated, time consuming, and grants are often kind of limiting, but it's a terrific idea. And if somebody wanted to go do that, that would be great. Um, I'm sort of appealing to people like Tabula Raza and say, hey, here's, here's an, I'm not trying to fit into a grant request, but rather just, just appeal to people who might have resources to help us out. But there's no reason not to have sort of a, uh, a list of questions, good questions that people have asked and what are our best answers to each of the questions, that's phenomenal. And those questions can be from conversations as well as, as grant uh, applications, right? Um, second thing is that uh, Vincent, uh, Pete has mentioned that, that you and I have a conversation in our future about the possible use of Trove as the dashboard for the projects, which makes a lot of sense to me. I'd love to, to do that. So let's, let's like find, find the time to talk uh, to figure out how that might work. Um, and Julian, you've got a question. Uh, well, not a question. I was thinking that this, what Vincent, what you're doing should have a more of a life cycle aspect to it. So not just a list of questions, but who asked the question, uh, whether answers worked or not, because, you know, an organization is looking for a certain kind of answer. And um, it would be good to track what kind of answer you thought that they were looking for. So, so th this falls into more of what they call life cycle. So. And a little bit of sort of double loop or triple loop learning on the questions. Yeah. So we get some feedback. Sorry, Vincent, I think you were about to say something too. That's interesting. So Julian, are you saying, um, so obviously there's like, you know, having multiple answers to a question, but are you saying like, um, who, who would be the one giving feedback on whether or not the question, the answer for a specific question was uh, useful. Uh, well, whoever was going through the process. Well, it'd be super interesting to have like electrodes implanted in the grant writer, the grant recipient, the grantor's brain, which could then register which answers really, really like rang their bell and then have that feedback, you know, straight go straight into the data. That would be perfect, but I don't think that's going to be easily implemented. No, but I know that when I've applied for grants, there's been feedback coming from uh, the institution. Yeah. I think that feedback should be part of that, that life cycle process of here's, here was a question, here was what happened. There's also a simpler, really, really blunt instrument, which is, hey, this, th we won this grant, we lost this grant. And then wherever you win a grant, the, the questions and answers in that batch get promoted somehow. So, because something in there was useful, but that's really blunt. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think a really good start would be like, the top five to 10 questions that are usually asked. And maybe, maybe you know, one of, one of the things that I feel like a lot of projects need help with, that might be something that OGM or some of the related communities can kind of assist is 
um, kind of helping projects just get started. Like, hey, in order to like give your project legs, like, you know, uh, Pete came up with a list of things that like an organization should have um, for a project, you'd like probably should have a mission statement. You probably should have a vision statement. And like those things can be like tweaked and changed once you have a basic one. If you're applying for a specific grant, that's kind of like in a certain domain that you might have to like change it a little bit. Um, but I think just helping projects kind of get like 80% there in terms of like having a public facing description uh, of the project, a vision, mission statement, um, you know, and being able to like have that so that other people can share it. So it's also like, you know, if you go on vacation for a month, going back to like Eric's point is like letting us be the connectors for each other and not having everything exist in our brains, like getting it out into a public brain where we can say, hey, oh, you should talk to this person and check out their project. And like, you know, here's the like, you know, 80% their summary that might not be completely up to date, but it's close enough. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap today's call. Uh, Stacey, go ahead. So this is going a whole different direction. So I apologize okay. beforehand, but you know, I've started to think about OGM as almost like a social club in, in, in a positive way. And I just, you know, I also think about the whole, you know, solving for trust and how things would be different if people weren't concerned about how they would get their next meal or where they would eat. So, you know, if we just took what we needed, so for, you know, we were working, we just took what we needed. Oh, I need, you know, I need a place to stay tonight. And I was just wondering, what it would be like if we were to call in some people like Stephanie Rarick or people that are really experienced with the gift economy and what it would look like setting up a gift economy within OGM. For example, I have a place in Naya. If you're here, you can stay here for free. I'm just, again, it's a whole different direction. I know it's not where you're going, but if it's something that's small enough we'd be able to see if that would work. Like that could tie into this whole, the game, the show, the weaving, all of that. Um, absolutely. And, and, and a set, a piece of the big fungus can actually be sort of within communities. What are the, what are the, the asks and the, and the gifts that we have? You know, the asks and offers. Um, and I think that those need to obey sort of community trust boundaries so that you, you, you don't wanna make your room available to like all of Craigslist, you, but you're willing to offer it to people in this community, which makes a lot of sense and sounds awesome. Well, and I would start with our community. I right. think we should actually start by doing it. Right. Um, okay, and then so some piece of that is really simple to do, which is like just to put a query on the OGM list or on a channel that says, uh, you know, list something you've got that you can offer and something that you could really use. And, you know, boom, that, 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 those things happen and, and they're pretty good, but the moment they get crowded uh, and the moment they age, they fall apart, right? So, so they have, they, they're, they're easy to do quickly and they get um, a lot of fun things, but then they, they, they don't, they don't age well. And uh, the Stephanie Rarick, what's the, could you spell the last name of the woman who? Um, I think it's, I would have to look it up. Uh, you know, we have this, this, this incredible oracle that can tell us everything. <laughs> uh, the moment we try to I have her on my Facebook friends so <laughs> and, I, and I love that we can even misspell things and, and the oracle magically usually finds its way back to the right the right spelling um so thank you any other thoughts on this before we wrap up the call Julie uh, you used the phrase a piece of the fungus is there a word for that a funglet that doesn't that doesn't really roll off the tongue does it no Makes me and think then, of what happens to coffee when you leave it sitting out for a week. Yeah, it gets a little fungly. Um, maybe a niblet. So I, I like to think of sort of nuggets in, in different ways, um, but I'm thinking usually of nuggets of information. Uh, Stacey, you, you sent that just to me, but- uh, Oh, will, sorry. That's okay. What uh, was so it? Re re okay, I'll clear it again. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And I'll, I'll find her online as well. Um, and yeah, and, and the whole, I mean, in what Eric was bringing into the conversation earlier, like, why is this important? Uh, one of the things that's happening is that there's, an, there's a wholesale involuntary renegotiation of the social contract happening globally right now. That 
uh, the uh, Occupy movement, Arab Spring, Gilets Jaunes, you, you name the movement around. It's a bunch of people saying, hey, my children's future looks much bleaker than my present, which is not that hot anyway. We need to break the system. We need to change the system. We need to figure things out. And pandemic has made that worse. And there have been sort of basic income experiments during the pandemic, even in the US. You could look at the rescue package that kept people in their homes and you know, you know, kept children fed as a form of UBI test. There's, there's, that's, that's not an unreasonable way to, of thinking about what just happened for 18 months. Uh, and so I think these conversations are hot and interesting and a piece of why we're busy trying to figure out the big fungus is like, so which of these models wins? Like, uh, can, can we help promote the healthiest of these models with, a, with an intention toward you know, well-being of the planet and the, and the humans uh, who, are, who are parasites on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you know the term theory of change? Have you seen, have you looked up about it, read about it? Okay. Because I, I think it would be nice for us to literally write it. Uh, like, from, like th this is what we're going to do. And we hope by reaching these people in this way, that change will happen. Yeah. I think so, so I definitely have theories of change. I don't know that I have a very sophisticated understanding of it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then I've got my favorite models for sense making amid complexity and then models and theories of individual social dynamics and so forth and so on. And I even put the I Ching under theories of change. Um, so, I've, so I've got something around this and I, clearly it, uh, I need to think about it deeper. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can use like a template or something to, to fill in to create a clear clear idea. It's a bit like a business canvas model, but then for your your model of change. Yep. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, thank you. And, and sorry, sorry to load so many things late into the call. Um, I, I was just like not organized to, to check in myself, but there's been a lot of stuff going on that I'm trying to sort out and make clearer. And this was really useful. So I appreciate your, your minds and hearts on this. Um, with that, let's wrap today's call and um, thank you. Let's, let's go feed the big fungus. <laughs> I hear there's a fungus among us. Uh, more than one. I'm tripping already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>